uh, to James. Thank you. Great. Thank you for the introduction, Andrew. Um, so yeah, as Andrea mentioned, my name is James Burtis. I'm a postdoctoral associate for the, I know it's a mouthful, but the Northeast Regional Center for Excellence in Vector-Borne Diseases. Um, we're a CDC-funded program to study uh, ticks and mosquitoes and, and their associated pathogens in, in the Northeast. Um, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the um, Asian longhorn tick. Um, this is a new invasive species that's, that's rapidly invading um, throughout the Northeast and really throughout a lot of states uh, east of the Mississippi at this point. Um, before we do that, I'm going to run over uh, the ticks we already have in the state. Um, so many of you will be familiar with Exodia scapularis, or the black-legged tick, or the deer tick. Um, deer tick is kind of an older name, but it, it still, gets, still gets used fairly regularly. Um, this is the most common um, tick people come across. It carries Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, and Poisson virus disease. Um, many of you have sure have come into contact with this tick at one point or another. Um, it's fairly widespread in this state. <laughs> um, Dermacentra variabilis, or the American dog tick, is another species that's very common in New York State. Um, it can be infected with Rocky Mountain spotted fever and tularemia, uh, but this is this is not as common in this region. Usually you see these infections further down in the, in the southeast. Um, Lone star ticks, um, I think we have some people from Long Island. You may be familiar with these ticks. Uh, they are very aggressive. Um, they're a little larger than black-legged ticks, and they're starting to out, outnumber black-legged ticks in the, in the southern part of the state. Um, they carry ehrlichiosis, um, the, the meat allergy, if you've heard about that, uh, tularemia, the southern, uh, tick rashes, southern tick associated rash illness, um, and heartland virus. Um, most of those infections are still fairly rare in the Northeast, um, but the tick is becoming much more common and seems to be expanding its range northward. Um, but the tick we're going to be focusing on today is Hemophilus longicornis, or the Asian longhorn tick. Um, as of this date, there are no infections that have been detected in the population in the United States, which is great news. Um, but I'm going to give you a little background on this tick and, and uh, explain uh, uh, what host it targets and what pathogens it does carry in its native range. Um, the Asian longhorn tick has a really uh, widespread range in Eastern Asia. So it can go, it covers uh, an area from Mongolia all the way down to Papua New Guinea. Um, so it has an enormous range. It is known to transmit um, one pathogen. Uh, it's called uh, severe fever with thrombocytopenia syndrome virus or SFTSV. Um, this is a, a virus that usually presents with a fairly high uh, fever um, and low blood count. It's just been identified fairly recently, um, so we don't know a whole lot about its transmission in Asia, um, but we are learning more as, as, as time moves on. It's also known to carry other tick-borne pathogens, but hasn't been shown to transmit them to people or be an effective uh, bridge vector to date, um, so that's good news for us. <laughs> um, but it is a major pest of livestock, and we'll get to that in a, in a minute. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about it. ticks as invasive species first. Um, most ticks don't make very good invasive species. Um, a single female can produce thousands of larvae. Um, if you spend any time in the field, you may have come across what sometimes we call tick bombs, um, which is just when you get you know, a thousand or, or a few hundred larvae on your pants walking through. Uh, one small area. <clears throat> That's often from a single female or a few female in a deer bed. Um, very few of these actually find a host to feed on and molt into nymphs. Um, so there's a huge, uh, I like to call the tick life cycle a war of attrition. There's a huge attrition as they move through the life cycle. Um, and even fewer of those make it into adulthood. So you have less than 1% of the larvae actually making it to adulthood. Um, and then they also have to find a mate. Um, so when you have really low densities, which you often have at the outset of an invasion, it's really unlikely that you're going to have a successful invasive population from just a few ticks. You need a fairly large number generally. Asian longhorn ticks are a little different. Um, they don't need no man. <laughs> They can reproduce on their own. So the females are parthenogenetic, which means that they can reproduce without a male. This cuts out that extra step and makes them much more effective as invasive species and allows them to spread much more rapidly um, than a tick normally would. 
Um, we know from some of the other places they've invaded and their native range that there are some effective control methods. Um, so these are livestock pests. So direct application of pesticides to livestock has been shown to be effective in controlling them. Um, habitat management, it's a little different than uh, black-legged ticks where uh, exposure kills them outright. Um, black-legged ticks, generally if you, if you mow a field um, and you keep your, your uh, brush down, you have a good chance of reducing populations. These ticks do better in open areas than black-legged ticks, but still, if you manage the habitat, if you cut your grass, um, if you clear your lawn, you'll still reduce habitat, um, they still do desiccate. They're just not as vulnerable as, as black-legged ticks as the ticks we're used to trying to manage in this area. Um, and then also dark targeted pesticide application in these infested areas. So if an area is infested with, with Longicornis at high densities, you can target that for pesticide application. Um, unfortunately, uh, carpet bombing pesticides is not, is not the best option for, for these ticks. Um, so I mentioned other invasions. Uh, the largest invasions are in Australia and New Zealand. Um, they've been in these countries since the early 1900s. They have a really strong impact on sheep and cattle. Um, they damage the skin, and for cattle, they also transmit a disease called filariosis, which can cause high mortality in calves. So they have a really Im uh, strong impact on, uh, on farming in, in, and uh, uh, herding in these countries. <laughs> um, in New Zealand, there does appear to be a strong north to south relationship um, relating to where the species can live. So here you're looking at a map where in the north, uh, remember this is in the southern hemisphere, so the north is warmer than the south flipped. Um, in the north where it's warmer, you find higher populations than you do in the south. Some of that may be related to where uh, to, to be where people are living and farming, um, but some of that may also be temperature related. We don't know a lot about the thermal tolerance of this species. Um, it's something that people are working on right now. We're trying to figure out how far north they actually can expand here in the United States. Um, they do, again, in, uh, in their native range, they go up farly, far, fairly far north, almost hitting Russia um, on its eastern, eastern shore. <laughs> Um, so spread in the U.S., this is a risk map of uh, where habitats, or uh, it's rather a habitat suitability map um, for where this tick may be able to spread based on its native range. But as I mentioned, this is one individual essentially. It's one female that reproduces by itself. So we don't know what the thermal tolerance of this population is. We need to figure that out. Um, this species was first identified in the United States in 2017. It appears to have been in the country since at least 2010, um, and now has been detected in many states um, east of the Mississippi. Uh, it's been identified on Long Island, um, up, up the, the Hudson Valley in Westchester, and I think now in Putnam as well. <coughs> it's all over New Jersey. It's in Pennsylvania. It is spreading, and it's spreading fairly rapidly. Um, part of it is that we weren't looking for it. It's it easily confused with some of our native species. Um, but part of it seems to be that it is indeed spreading much more rapidly than we would have expected to. <clears throat> Currently, no, again, no pathogens, uh, no human targeting pathogens uh, have been detected in the U.S. population, which is awesome. Also, it has re very recently been shown to not be a competent vector for Lyme disease, which is also good news. Um, on the good news front, it also doesn't really like people. Um, so this is a video one of our grad students took, and I just want you to take a look at the difference between how it deer tick acts around people and how an Asian longhorn tick acts around people. This is a deer tick um, and this is this is her finger and you can see as she moves it around the black-legged tick will track her and basically try to bite her. <laughs> They're a little slow. I'm just gonna forward here a little bit. Um, here's the Asian longhorn tick, and you can see there is absolutely no interest in trying to bite her. Um, she has other videos where she actually puts the tick on her finger and it will fall off. <clears throat> so again, we've had a fairly large number of people collecting these ticks from the field. Very few of them have been bitten, which is excellent news, which means it does not target um, humans re uh, readily or easily. It will affect livestock and uh, uh, wildlife though, because it does appear to target deer. Um, so this is the only information we have currently about the, the habitat and activity of 
longicornis of this of this uh, native or this invasive species in the United States. This is Staten Island. A uh, recent uh, sur uh, survey was published uh, a few months ago, showing that uh, this species really likes to feed on deer. Um, their densities on deer actually have started to outnumber black-legged ticks on Staten Island. Um, and they also like to live in a pretty wide variety of habitats. Um, they will live in forests, but they do seem to prefer fields overall. Um, they seem to target uh, pasture grazing animals. So we're learning a lot about their, their, uh, their habitat ecology. We also know that they don't target small mammals as frequently um, as other species, which is good news again, because many of those small mammals are the, res the natural reservoirs for a lot of tick-borne diseases. So it's looking more and more like they're not gonna be important vectors or bridge vectors of, uh, of uh, human diseases, but they most likely will have some fairly large impacts on wildlife and, um, and uh, uh, livestock. They also have, this is a, a quick graph of their, <coughs> their activity through a single summer. Um, this is showing just one summer, June through August. Um, and they actually show somewhat similar activity levels to the black-legged tick, which is interesting. Um, so the nymphs come out kind of in the early summer. The, uh, the adults are active. It looks like actually all the way through the fall. This doesn't go out that far. And the larvae become active later in the summer. Um, on that note, I'm going to throw this over to Talia, and then we can, we can break for questions. That sounds good. All right. Um, I'll just start my screen share. All right, uh, thanks for the introduction earlier. Again, I'm Talia Shrigai, a PhD candidate at Cornell University, and my research is on mosquito ecology. So I'll be talking a little generally about mosquito biology and then about mosquito invasions in New York today. Um, I'm gonna start off by talking about um, mosquito biology just because there are 3,000 species of mosquitoes with a huge diversity in their biology and their ecology. And part of what uh, makes mosquito management so complicated is that what works for one species or even one population of the same species won't necessarily work for another. And the better we understand their biology, the better we can do at control and management. Um, so mosquitoes have distinct life stages. They start off as eggs, and this is a video of a Culex mosquito laying her egg rafts. Uh, the eggs get laid in very different ways depending on the mosquito. Uh, some like this one need to be laid on water, uh, but others like the 80s eggs pictured close up here and on the right, right zoomed out, uh, don't need to be laid on water at all. They're laid above the water line where they can sit completely dry for up to months. And then when conditions are good and those are flooded with water, uh, they'll hatch then. After they hatch, they enter the larval stage um, where they'll develop into the adults. This takes about a week, um, but that timing really depends on the temperature. So if it's colder, it'll take them a lot longer to develop. Um, the, the water needed for development is again, very, very different from species to species. Uh, for some, it's very specific. So they only lay uh, their eggs in rock pools or in crab holes on the beach or in large marshes. And many of the mosquitoes we're dealing with day to day in New York are container mosquitoes. So they're laying in anything like a tire or a flower pot or a bucket that holds standing water, even if it's a very, very small volume of water. And then they're gonna close into the adult uh, where they'll start looking for mates and for food. Uh, the adults live about two to three weeks, but that's very dependent on the environment that the adult mosquito experiences. So once that mosquito starts looking for a host, what's gonna attract it? Uh, mosquitoes are really good at uh, different kinds of sensing. So first they're looking for plumes of CO2. Every time you breathe out, you're breathing out CO2, and that's a really good indicator that you are something living with uh, good blood flow. And mosquitoes can sense CO2 from up to 50 meters away and then follow that plume back down to its source. 
Uh, mosquitoes are also very sensitive to sound. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the whine that a mosquito makes. That is actually a mosquito love song. So most species of mosquitoes, the male sings one note, the female sings the harmony to that note. So if you sing your song, you hear the harmony, you know you sound the same species opposite sex. And it's a good and mosquitoes can hear from up to 30 meters away. Uh, body odors are also really important. Um, different kinds of mosquitoes feeds on different kinds of hosts. Some are very specific, only feed on birds, only feed on frogs, others are more generalist. But because every species has a different smell, it's a good way for the mosquitoes to tell you apart. Uh, the human smell is made up of about 200 different chemicals that come up off of our skin, and every person has a slightly different balance of those chemicals. And that's one of the reasons that some people are more attractive to mosquitoes than others. Mosquitoes can see, but they're not great seers. So if you hold your arm straight out in front of you and lift your palm up straight, that's about the pixel size that a mosquito sees in. Uh, so they can use vision to navigate, but really can't see any details. And then once they're, uh, they're very close to you, they'll use heat sensing to help find the vein to go in on. This is what it looks like when a mosquito bites you. The proboscis is not a needle. It is more like an elephant trunk, so flexible and sensitive. You can see it moving around under the skin, searching for a vein, finding one, and doing what it does. So some common, important, and invasive mosquitoes in New York. I'm just going to talk about two. The first is, uh, or three, sorry, um, but one of the most common ones is the Japanese bush mosquito, Aedes japonicus. This is an invasive species from Japan that's spread all over the United States. It's very, very successful. It's a container and tree hole, um, lays its eggs in containers and tree holes. It's a pretty generalist feeder and it's not an aggressive human biter. And while it's shown to be competent for some diseases in the lab, it's not really an important factor of any major arbovirus. Uh, the second is the common house mosquito, a few different Culex species. This is a native mosquito. Uh, it also, it has container larvae and often lays its eggs in pretty dirty water, so things like septic tanks, although they're not super specific. Uh, it often feeds on birds, but also does feed on other species, including humans. And it's a vector of West Nile and Eastern equine encephalitis or trip. And then the last, the Asian tiger mosquito, Aedes albopictus. This is an invasive species in the United States. It is an extremely successful uh, invasive. It has container larvae. It's an aggressive human biter, but it's a pretty opportunistic feeder. So whatever species around, that's what it'll feed on. And globally, it's a vector of chikungunya, zika, and dengue. But it, these diseases are not really important in the Northeast or in uh, New York. Um, and while it's been shown to be a competent vector of West Nile and Tripoli in the lab, it has not been shown to be an important vector of those in the real world, in the field. I'm going to talk a little bit about the U.S. invasion of Aedes albopictus. Um, these mosquitoes are native to Eastern Asia and over the last 30 years have colonized the entire globe. They're now present on every continent except for Antarctica. Uh, and in the United States, it came into Texas in the tire pile in 1986 and quickly colonized the entire eastern United States. So that's a map from 2015 um, of all of their invasion sites. And these invasions are still ongoing. So uh, it looks even farther now in 2019. Some of the things that make them so successful, first the eggs can BS. So I should do those eggs earlier that can sit outside of water. Aedes albopictus, their eggs can sit dry for months, so they can lay in a tire. That tire can be thrown into a boat or into a truck, transported somewhere completely new, far away, and they can start a new population as soon as that gets flooded. Uh, Aedes albopictus also uh, can go into diapause, egg diapause. Um, so this is how they survive winter in cold places like New York. In the fall, they'll lay diapausing or hibernating eggs that have a slightly thicker layer and are really uh, resistant to desiccation and to cold. And those eggs can just sit over the entire winter, and then when conditions are good again in the spring, they'll hatch and start their new summer population. And this ability to diapause has adapted very quickly um, over space and time, so that they're really, really uh, fine-tuned into local conditions and surviving winter. Aedes albopictus is a very plastic species, a very flexible species. 
Uh, some mosquitoes are very specific about their habitat, about their host, about their larval development sites. Azelbopictus is not. It's a generalist feeder. It does well in urban, peri-urban, rural environments. It can lay its eggs in a wide variety of habitats. So it's going to be successful in a lot of different places. Um, because the larvae develop in these small cryptic containers, like something as small as a bottle cap, eliminating or finding all of the larval habitat is close to impossible. And on top of that, um, surveillance and management, particularly here in New York, is pretty sporadic and underfunded, and it's really hard to manage a species if we don't even know exactly where it is or how many there are. Um, the Northeast invasion is rapid and ongoing. So this is a map of uh, Connecticut in between 2006 and 2016, where it, uh, you can see its invasion over those years uh, moving northwards in the state. And this is happening in various states across, uh, across the United States. Um, why is it so hard to manage even when we do know where it is? Uh, again, um, it's really hard to manage the amateurs because the containers that they're laying their eggs in are dispersed and they're everywhere and they're often hidden or on private property. So uh, getting them on a citywide scale, reaching everything as close to impossible. And adult control is often ineffective. Uh, populations back, bounce back very quickly after spraying because of these immatures that are in containers that are hard to reach or through migration, just new mosquitoes will fly in from the surrounding area. Uh, they also can re uh, develop resistance to pesticides. We're currently testing the levels of resistance in New York populations. James is working on that right now. And then again, we have a lack of funding and resources for surveillance and control. So these things mean that a lot of the management of Aedes albopictus relies on homeowners to do a lot of the work. This is where Aedes albopictus has been detected in New York this year, um, so up through Orange County although we don't have surveillance in all, um, all of the counties of New York. And in kind of bounces back and forth in between being found in uh, Sullivan, Ulster, and Putnam. So that's how far north we regularly find populations. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about mosquito-borne disease in the Northeast. Uh, many mosquito-borne diseases are transmitted through a very simple cycle of mosquito to human. But the cycles can become more complex. So there can be diseases. Uh, this is an example of a complex cycle where most of the transmission occurs between mosquitoes and birds. However, if a mosquito feeds on birds as well as other species, it can become a bridge vector if it picks up the disease from a bird and then affects something like a horse or a human. In the case of Triple E or West Nile, which are two diseases that follow this cycle, we can get sick, but there's not actually enough virus in our systems to transmit to another, to another mosquito. So we're con considered dead end hosts. Um, I mentioned that specific cycle because triple E um, is a disease of concern this year. Uh, this is normally transmitted between birds and the Coolacetta melanura mosquito, but QX mosquitoes can pick it up and then transmit it to horses or humans. Most people infected with triple E develop no symptoms, but 5% uh, do develop symptoms that can be neuroinvasive, and one third of people who get triple E will die, and then people who do survive can be left with lifelong serious mental and physical impairments. On an average year, there's seven cases per year in the United States, but in 2019, we had an outbreak, um, 30 cases with 11 deaths concentrated in Michigan, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. Uh, this is a map of triple E in New York State in 2019. So while mosquitoes have been found uh, infected with triple E, there have been no human reported cases. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about what uh, people can do in their homes to control, since that's where most of the control happens right now. First is getting rid of larvae through source reduction, so that's emptying or throwing out any containers that hold standing water storing containers upside down or covering them tightly, and then using mosquito dunks that have BTI, which uh, kills mosquitoes but doesn't hurt your dog, or your kid, or you, um, or fish as a larvicide, or something else that you, in any water that you want to leave out. Um, I did a series of larval surveys a couple years ago with homeowners, and the number one comment I got from people was that I don't have any standing water in my yard. Uh, and while there are some obvious containers that are easy to keep track of, like tires or planters or curd baths, we found a lot of overlooked containers, like the bases of basketball hoops, 
toys that people are leaving out in their yard or tarps that fold up and then collect rainwater. So it really is worth doing a very thorough check of your backyard for any standing water. And then of course the weird containers and infested toilet, washing machine and sculpture garden. Uh, you can do uh, mosquito control towards adults using pesticides, but this is minimally effective unless all your neighbors do it too on a regular basis in combination with source reduction, for those reasons I mentioned earlier. Pesticides also kill non-target insects, insects and can cause resistance. So this really is not the most effective way to manage the species. And then finally, personal protection. Uh, some safe, effective repellents are DEET, which is very rigorously tested and safe and lasts for a long time. Although it does have a strong smell and a high concentration can melt plastic, although it's safe for people. Uh, something that's equally effective, um, but doesn't have a strong smell and does not melt plastic, the Keratin and IR 3535 are both uh, good products. And then if you want something natural using oil of lemon eucalyptus, which uh, smells great, totally natural, but is not quite as effective and doesn't last for quite as long. And then just a quick list of things that have a reputation of working, but don't have any scientific proof of working. Citronella, eating garlic, sonic devices, light trap devices, wristbands, mosquito plants, and mosquito coils if there's any kind of breeze. Um, mosquito control is not a static field. There's a lot of research being done to try to develop new tools and methods. Um, a couple of those that are uh, on the market right now are suppression Wolbachia mosquitoes. This is releasing male mosquitoes that have a bacteria in them that makes all of their offspring sterile. So you release these males into your home and uh, they breed with the wild mosquitoes and drop the populations. This is legal in some states, but not all. It is legal in New York, um, but it's really just getting started. So this isn't a cheap or easy product to acquire. And then wide area larviciding, can we uh, spray things uh, across a lot wide area that suppresses larvae instead of adults? Again, it's really hard to reach all the containers, but we're, uh, different groups are currently testing the efficacy of these methods. And then something that's in development, but not currently available, are GMO 80 cellulose pictures that you can release and uh, produce sterile offspring. So with that, thank you. And I think now me and James have some time for questions. Great, thank you.